Action Keynote. Secretary Panetta served as the 23rd Secretary of Defense. And before joining the Department of Defense, he served as Director of the Central Intelligence Agency. During his time at the CIA, Secretary Panetta led and managed human intelligence and open source collection programs on behalf of the intelligence community. He's dedicated much of his life to public service. And before joining the CIA, he spent 10 years co-directing with his wife, Sylvia, the Leon and Sylvia Panetta Institute for Public Policy. Based at Cal State University, Monterey Bay, the Institute is a nonpartisan, not-for-profit center that seeks to instill in young men and women the virtues and the values of public service. In March 2006, he was chosen as a member of the Iraq Studies Group, a bipartisan committee established at the urging of Congress to conduct an independent assessment of the war in Iraq. I could go on and on about Secretary Panetta's public life and public service, but that would just eat into his time. But he's a true patriot and American citizen who's devoted his life to public service. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us from California, Secretary Leon Panetta. Thank, thank you very much for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. Uh, and I'm really, really very pleased uh, and honored uh, to be with you uh, at this uh, U.S. Naval Academy's conference on military uh, and uh, diplomatic efforts. Uh, I'm honored for several reasons. First of all, uh, even though I served as an intelligence officer in the Army for two years, uh, my son Jimmy, who's a member of Congress, was a naval intelligence officer uh, who served uh, in Afghanistan, uh, working out of Bagram uh, with uh, Special Forces uh, and earning a Bronze Star. That uh, We're very proud of what he did. Uh, but more importantly, our grandson, uh, Michael, is now an ensign in the Navy. Uh, he's assigned to a destroyer. Uh, out of San Diego and uh, just went through, uh, you know, uh, a, a, an incredible program on search and rescue in the Navy and managed to survive it uh, and do well. So we're, we're proud of him as well. Uh, I should also mention that yesterday uh, here at uh, Pebble Beach at the Monterey Country Club, uh, I participated in a fundraiser for the Navy Postgraduate School Foundation. Uh, it was a golf tournament. Uh, we had a lot of fun, but more importantly, we raised money for the Navy Postgraduate School. Uh, I've been very proud of uh, the Postgraduate School because it really does perform an, an extremely important role uh, in the 21st century for the Navy by providing advanced education to our Naval officers and other officers so that uh, they understand the challenges that we're confronting uh, in a new world of technology. And I'm honored for all of you to be with all of you. Uh, and your dedication to doing what's important in terms of protecting our national security. Uh, if you'll allow me, uh, I just have to say a few words of tribute, uh, obviously, on the passing of Colin Powell. Colin Powell was a good friend. Uh, he was uh, somebody who you know, I really paid a lot of attention to in terms of his guidance and advice. He was always a straight shooter, was very honest about uh, the issues that we were confronting. And most importantly, he was very dedicated to what this country is all about. And uh, I guess my concern is that uh, in losing Colin Powell, uh, it's the passing of a generation of leaders who really cared about our national security, cared about our values as a country, and always, always placed country over party. Uh, and I think those are all principles that 
frankly, we need we need to stand by and hope that new generations of leaders will understand the importance of those qualities. As Secretary of Defense, I thought my most important responsibility was to protect the security of the United States of America and protect the American people. And I was extremely proud of all the men and women in uniform that put their lives on the line in order to protect our country. Now, there are two things I'm particularly proud of uh, having served as secretary. One is to give everyone the opportunity to be able to serve in our military. I'm, I'm the son of Italian, Italian immigrants. Uh, I had the opportunity to live the American dream and I think it's important to give all young people uh, the opportunity to be able to serve their nation. In addition to that, uh, I was proud of being able to work with all of the branches of the military to focus on trying to develop a defense strategy for the 21st century. Uh, when I became secretary, uh, the Congress had uh, handed uh, the Defense Department, the responsibility to reduce the defense budget uh, by almost uh, $500 billion. And I thought rather than taking steps to just cut everything across the board, that it, we really ought to use it as an opportunity to talk about how do we develop a, de a new defense strategy that fits the challenges of the 21st century. And we were able to do that, working together uh, with military leaders, with our civilian leaders at the Pentagon. And some of the points we arrived at, uh, I think, are applicable today. Uh, one was the importance of stressing agility and the ability to deploy quickly uh, in the military, to be able to respond to the crises that we may face uh, in the 21st century. Secondly, we rebalanced our force to the Pacific because we recognized the challenge that we would face in the Pacific. Uh, and it's important to understand that that remains a challenge and that we do need to uh, establish a competitive force in the Pacific to protect our interests there. Thirdly, uh, we stress something called rotational deployment. Uh, rather than worrying about building bases abroad, we thought it was more important to be able to deploy forces, to be able to work with other countries to train and develop their security capabilities. Uh, and uh, we did that, uh, not only using special forces, but using the Army and other elements of the military as well. And we also thought it was important to be strong enough to confront the possibility of two wars, a war obviously uh, in Korea and a war uh, in, uh, in the Gulf, and be able to respond effectively to dealing with both wars. And lastly, and most importantly, the importance of making investments in new technology. We have got to stay on the cutting edge of technology as a country developing our cyber capabilities, developing our special forces capabilities, developing our artificial intelligence capabilities, that's extremely important. So those elements I think are equally true today as we, as we have this conversation. I know you're focused as a conference on the issue of military power and diplomacy. And uh, I think all of you know that it's difficult to go into depth on, in the, all of those areas in the time that we have. But what I wanted to do was to outline some thoughts for all of you, uh, and uh, then obviously respond to your questions as well. Look, first and foremost, I believe the United States has to be a world leader. We were a world leader, obviously in World War II, and we continue to be a world leader in the post-World War II era. And as a result of our leadership in the world, uh, we achieved a great deal uh, with the Truman Doctrine, with containment, 
with the ability to develop alliances like NATO to provide for our security in the world, the ability to uh, prevail when it came to the Cuban Missile Crisis in a confrontation with Russia, uh, the ability to ultimately win the Cold War and bring the, the Berlin Wall down, uh, the ability to respond to the vicious attack against the United States on 9-11 uh, and go after those who were responsible for conducting that attack. Uh, yes, and I will also mention uh, the importance of the, of the bin Laden operation, going after bin Laden. As uh, director of the CIA, uh, I had the opportunity to, to help lead that effort along with uh, Admiral Bill McRaven, uh, who led special forces. Uh, and it was important because it sent a message to the world that nobody attacks the United States of America and gets away with it. So we've had some successes in terms of world leadership. We've also made mistakes, uh, mistakes in Vietnam, mistakes with the Bay of Pigs, mistakes in providing arms to Nicaragua, Somalia, we, uh, Mogadishu uh, was uh, in many ways a failure being able to respond to the emergency that was there. Uh, the helicopters that went down is in the effort to try to rescue hostages in Iran. And obviously the problems of trying to deal with nation building both in Iraq and Afghanistan, and particularly recently, the strategic failure that took place uh, in Afghanistan. But overall, you know, as as a world leader, we have done well to try to preserve the peace of the world and to support the values that we represent. Uh, most, the most important strength we have is our values as a country, the values of uh, our freedoms, our rights, respect for human dignity, the ability to give everybody the opportunity to succeed regardless of who they are, the ability to achieve both social and economic progress, and the ability to stress the rule of law. Those are all important values that represent what the United States of America is all about. And we've used those values to try to build alliances in the world, important alliances, in terms of being able to confront our adversaries and those who would try to undermine the values that we're all about. How do we do this? How do we do this? We did it through a combination, obviously, of military power. We are the strongest military force on the face of the earth. And that is extremely important to our ability to provide world leadership because it represents leverage in terms of another important capability we have, which is diplomacy. The ability to have military power and a strong diplomatic force that's able to engage and negotiate with the rest of the world is a vital combination. And I'm gonna add a third element because as director of the CIA, I saw how important it was, which is good intelligence. I don't think you can be a strong military power. I don't think you can be a strong diplomatic power without good intelligence, knowing what's happening in the world, knowing the threats that are out there in the world that we have to confront, uh, the ability to understand those threats, to understand where our adversaries are coming from is extremely important to our ability to lead and to protect our national security. So we need all of those important ingredients because I, I believe, as Teddy Roosevelt said, that we, the United States should speak softly but carry a big stick. Uh, and that is incredibly important to our ability to be able to protect our national security. And all of this is more critical than ever. Today in 2021, in the 21st century, 
I think we made a mistake in the last few years with the, the idea that somehow it was about America first and that we could withdraw from leadership in the world. Uh, we made that mistake in the 1930s with the, the whole emphasis on isolationism uh, and the fact that somehow we didn't have to engage with the rest of the world when Nazism and fascism were taking over uh, Europe uh, and the world. We paid a price for that. We ultimately went to war. And in many ways, we were making the same mistake those last few years by withdrawing from leadership, withdrawing from the support of our allies and creating a vacuum. And when America creates a vacuum in leadership, our adversaries are gonna take advantage of it. And that's exactly what happened. Russia took advantage of that vacuum uh, and so is China. With the election of uh, President Biden, uh, because of his experience, he stressed the return of the role of the United States to world leadership and the fact that America is back. But whether or not the United States will provide that leadership and whether or not America is back remains to be seen. And it remains to be determined by how we respond to the threats that are in the world today facing the United States. Look, we're, we live in a dangerous world and we're facing a number of flashpoints in the world, probably more flashpoints we, that we're facing in terms of security since World War II. And it is gonna require the United States to provide leadership by being a strong military power and by exercising diplomacy and by acquiring good intelligence. What are some of those flashpoints? Well, one is the continuing threat of terrorism, very frankly. Although we responded to the attack on 9-11, went after Al-Qaeda, went after those who attacked us on 9-11, the reality is that because of the strategic failure in Afghanistan. We are now providing a, a, a safe haven for terrorism in Afghanistan that is very dangerous. Uh, and there's no question that the Taliban that rules Afghanistan today is very much the same Taliban that ruled on 9-11 and provided a safe haven for bin Laden and Al Qaeda to be able to develop the plans for the 9-11 attack. Today, make no mistake about it, the Taliban is gonna allow safe haven for Al Qaeda to resurrect itself in Afghanistan. Uh, and how long it takes, uh, we're not sure, but I think within a few years, Al Qaeda will represent uh, a threat to the United States, along with ISIS, uh, which also is located in Afghanistan, along with, frankly, the Haqqanis, who continue to exercise uh, terrorism in that part of the world. We're gonna have to confront ISIS in the Middle East, in Syria, and in other countries where, the, where we have failed states. Failed states in the Middle East is the breeding ground for terrorism. And so terrorism is gonna continue to develop there and metastasize not only ISIS, but Al-Shabaab in Somalia and elsewhere, Boko Haram in North Africa. So it is going to require our ability to deploy special forces and to conduct important counterterrorism operations. We've learned how to do counterterrorism uh, operations well but it's gonna require our ability to be able to deploy those kinds of operations against terrorism, wherever it is, 
and wherever it's located. We need good intelligence to be able to determine where those threats are. And frankly, we're going to need strong diplomacy as well to be able to build alliances that can respond to the terrorism threat. I think it's particularly true in the Middle East. Our ability to build a strong alliance with our moderate Arab friends along with Israel to be able to develop the kind of alliance that can respond to terrorism threats, respond to the threat from Iran, uh, I think we need to have that kind of alliance in order to be able to deal with the threats that we are confronting, uh, particularly in the Middle East. We need to obviously maintain our NATO alliance in dealing with the threat coming from uh, Afghanistan and other countries in that region. So the ability to be able to not only have strong military capabilities, but also a strong diplomatic effort to try to assure alliances that can respond to that threat are going to be particularly important. Iran, obviously, is another threat, continuing threat to our security. Uh, and as a result of that, obviously, we've built our military forces in the Gulf, and it's important to maintain uh, that deterrent in the Gulf uh, with regards to Iran. And at the same time, we are trying to exercise diplomacy, working with the, uh, uh, the Gang of Five to try to see if we can bring Iran back within the limits of the nuclear agreement. Not easy to do. Hardliners have been elected there. Uh, they've committed uh, to maintain their capabilities. Uh, and yet, this will be a test of whether or not uh, our diplomatic capability can match our military capability in trying to deal with the threat from Iran. North Korea, another rogue nation. Uh, we've just seen North Korea continue to launch new missile systems. Uh, they, they launched a missile off a submarine recently. They're continuing to launch missiles. They're continuing to build their nuclear weapons stockpile. And without question, they represent a threat, a threat to the security of South Korea and Japan, but more importantly, a threat to the United States of America. We do have a military force in South Korea. I think we need to maintain that military force in South Korea. We need to maintain our naval capabilities in Japan. The most important deterrence we have on North Korea is for them to understand that if they initiate any conflict with the United States or others in the region, that their regime will be annihilated, and it will be. That deterrence is extremely important. So having established that, it's also important, I think, to try to continue to reach out diplomatically. Now, obviously, it was an effort to do high-level negotiations between the president and the head of North Korea uh, that, did, that was not successful. And the reason it's not successful is because you can't conduct negotiations without preparation. So if diplomacy is going to be effective, diplomacy has to be prepared. You've got to be able to establish what is it that you can accomplish, where are the areas where you can find agreement, where are you going to disagree, but ultimately what steps can you put into place to try to reduce tensions. I hope we can continue that kind of diplomatic effort and also gather the kind of intelligence that's necessary. There's no, there's no secret here that North Korea is a hard target. And it's very difficult to find out exactly what North Korea has been up to. We need to improve our intelligence in order to be able to improve our diplomacy, in order to be able to improve our military capabilities when it comes to North Korea. Russia, obviously, uh, we're engaged in a Cold War with Russia again, a renewed Cold War. And 
Part of it is because Russia has read weakness on the part of the United States in the last few years. And they've taken advantage of that, whether it was in the Crimea or the Ukraine or Syria or Libya, or whether it's the election interference that they targeted the United States with and continue to target the United States with. Obviously, we need to maintain our military capabilities uh, in Europe. Working with NATO is extremely critical to make sure that that alliance remains strong and that uh, other countries in Europe are meeting their responsibilities to be able to provide security on their own. Uh, we need to continue to pressure Europe to be strong partners when it comes to NATO. And at the same time, we need to conduct important diplomacy with our allies. I think this is, a, this is an area where the United States needs to work with our NATO allies in conducting the kind of negotiations that are critical to reducing tensions, trying to find areas where we can work together uh, with Russia in terms of terrorism, as well as uh, nuclear disarmament. But it is not going to be easy. It has to be done from a position of strength, not a position of weakness. And the strength is reflected if the United States maintains its military power and makes very clear to the Russians where the lines are that they cannot cross. Once you do that, then you have the ability to try to make some diplomatic gains. So negotiating from strength is at the heart of what will be necessary with our relationship with Russia. Same thing's true for China. China obviously took advantage of a vacuum that they saw. Uh, they've developed uh, belt and road initiatives. They've expanded ports throughout the world. Uh, they continue to make uh, economic investments throughout the world. They are engaging in diplomacy. They've sent their diplomats almost everywhere in the world. And they are continuing to build up their military capabilities. They're developing new technologies, both with regards to cyber as well as space. They're developing artificial intelligence capabilities. And they've obviously continued to assert themselves in the South China Sea uh, and threaten the security of Taiwan. Again, it is extremely important for the United States as a Pacific power to show our military strength in the Pacific through our naval, naval capabilities, through the Marines uh, being located in important areas of the Pacific, as well as the Army and the Air Force. We need to rebalance our power to the Pacific. We need to develop better intelligence our intelligence has been impacted in China in recent years. Uh, we need to reestablish good intelligence, both human as well as technological. And I think we need to obviously, again, stress diplomacy. I think what uh, America did with regards to Britain and Australia in promoting the development of uh, nuclear submarines was an important step. Uh, it could have been handled a little better with regards to uh, France, but at the same time, it was an important step to take to make clear to China that uh, countries in the Pacific are going to work together to protect our security. I think the Quad uh, relationship is an important one to maintain in that part of the world with India and Australia, the United States and Japan working together uh, in order to uh, deal with uh, the the threat from China. And I would also add building a stronger alliance in the ASEAN countries and developing their security capabilities, I think is also uh, going to be very important to our ability to again be able to negotiate with China from strength. That's ultimately what the goal is here. Assert our military power, assert our strength, make clear where the lines are with China that they cannot cross 
but at the same time be willing to negotiate in terms of the areas where we can arrive at some consensus. And lastly, there's a series of other threats that are out there, whether it's the development of autocracies, uh, Venezuela, Europe, uh, the rest of the world, uh, threatening democracies, uh, that, that represents a threat. COVID-19 and a pandemic. Uh, I think the failure of the world to really work together to control the pandemic uh, has not been uh, something that anyone is particularly proud of. We need to work with the rest of the world effectively if we're gonna deal with uh, COVID-19. Climate change, uh, and particularly the effect of climate change on security. I think that's something we have to pay attention to. And lastly, cyber. Cyber is the battlefield of the future. Uh, I think that you know, of all of the areas that I've just discussed, the threat of a potential cyber attack against the United States that can cripple our democracy is real. We saw what the Shamoon, Shamoon virus did when it was deployed against Aramco oil by Iran. They shut down 30,000 computers. They shut down Aramco oil. You can use that same kind of sophisticated virus to literally paralyze our own country, take down our national, our, our national grid system, our electric grid system, take down our financial systems, our government systems, take down our chemical systems, our transportation systems. Uh, that is, that is a, a strong potential threat against the United States if cyber gets into the wrong hands. So while a lot of these threats are there and challenge both our military and diplomatic capability, I think they also resurrect what the United States is going to have to do if we are going to be able to maintain uh, our role as world leader. We, we are going to have to rebuild and reform our military. We're at an inflection point. And if we do not invest in the kind of technology that we absolutely need in the military, it will impact on our strength and on our military power. So investing and, re and reforming our military is necessary. Look, there's a lot of bureaucratic uh, paralysis. There's a lot of paralysis, frankly, from the Congress in terms of their unwillingness to make those kinds of changes. But we absolutely have to do it if our military is gonna remain the strongest in the world. We have to rebuild our diplomacy. Our diplomacy was badly undermined uh, these last few years. We've gotta rebuild diplomatic capability. We've got to strengthen our intelligence capability as well in order to make sure that we protect both our military and our diplomatic strength. But lastly, we also have to strengthen our democracy, ladies and gentlemen. I think one of the threats to our security is not the threats I talked about is from abroad, which are there and real, but also the threats to our democracy from within. Bob Mueller, or not Bob Mueller, but uh, uh, Admiral, Admiral Mullen once said that the debt represents a threat to our national security. I think he's right, but I think right now the biggest threat is whether or not our democracy can function. That requires strong leadership. In my time in public service, I've seen Washington at its best and Washington at its worst. The good news is I saw Washington work. Republicans and Democrats willing to work together on the big issues confronting our country. Did they have their political differences? Of course. But when it came to major issues facing the country, they worked together. Today, Washington is at its worst in terms of the dysfunction, the polarization, the divisions, the partisanship, the inability to work together, and particularly what we saw happen on January 6th at the United States Capitol. That sends a message to the world of weakness on the part of the United States. So it's, it's not just about military power. 
it's not just about diplomacy. It's also about the quality of leadership. I often tell the students at the Panetta Institute in a democracy, we govern either by leadership or crisis. If leadership is there and willing to take the risks associated with leadership, we can avoid crisis, certainly contain it. But if leadership is not there, we will govern by crisis. And too often lately, we've governed by crisis. And as I said, if our democracy fails to function, it sends a terrible message to our adversaries and to our allies about whether the United States really is the strongest power on the face of the earth. Let me conclude by saying I believe in American leadership. Uh, I've been to the academy, I've been to West Point, I've been to all of our academies, and what I see is the future strength of America in the eyes of our men and women in uniform that are willing to put their lives on the line in order to protect this country. I think that that kind of leadership is incredibly important to the survival of our democracy. And I've seen it. I've seen it not just in our men and women in uniform, I've seen it in our, in our men and women who serve in the intelligence uh, area and special forces and other areas. When I was CIA director, uh, we were working with a possible source that we hoped could lead us to uh, bin Laden. Uh, when we developed a meeting with that source in Afghanistan at host, uh, unfortunately, that individual turned out to be a, a double agent who had a suicide vest and set it off and killed seven CIA officers. In visiting with their families uh, and in visiting the site of that attack and host, I brought a plaque with me that had a quote from Isaiah that says, the Lord said, who will go for me? Whom shall I send? And I responded, here I am, Lord, send me, send me. I think that really is the sound of the trumpet that calls all of us to duty, calls all of us to our responsibility to make sure our military remains strong, to make sure that we have a strong diplomatic arm to our diplomacy and to our capability, that we develop strong intelligence, but most importantly, that we develop a democracy that is strong, in which all of us swear to preserve, protect, and defend our Constitution. Thank you very much for having me. Secretary Panetta, this is uh, Pete Daly, CEO and publisher of the Naval Institute again. Thank you for those remarks. It provides great context for our entire discussion today. Um, I'd like to just lead off with, before I go to some of the uh, questions that we've received, I'd like to lead off with a question, you know, if I could summarize and perhaps take the liberty of summarizing maybe too much, that you strongly believe that we must be a nation of strength and deal from a position of strength. And at the end, you cited the threat to democracy and the requirement for leadership. Um, we've seen with some distress over the last several years uh, the nation seemed to divide up into tribes, and the idea of citizenship seems to have broken down a bit. You, your prescription was leadership. Could you briefly outline maybe what would constitute the first few steps of that? What would be the first steps that you would take to mend those fences? It is, uh, it's without question, uh, probably one of the biggest challenges we face uh, in our democracy. Uh, as I said, I, I, you know, I've seen Washington at its best. When I first went back to Washington 
as a legislative assistant to uh, minority whip in, in the Senate. Uh, Tom Keekle uh, was the fellow I worked for. He was a progressive or Republican out of the Hiram Johnson tradition. Uh, there were people, and some, of your, some in your audience will remember these names, people like Javits and Clifford Case uh, and uh, Hugh Scott, George Aiken, uh, Mark Hatfield, who were willing to work with Democrats like Dick Russell, uh, work with Democrats like Hubert Humphrey and Bill Fulbright. Uh, and again, they had their political differences, but they worked together on major issues. Uh, when I got elected to Congress, Chip O'Neill was the speaker, a Democrat's Democrat from Boston. But he had a great relationship with Bob Michael, who was the minority leader. And although they had their political differences, when it came to big issues, they worked together. I mean, in, in the Reagan administration, they worked together to pass Social Security reform, the so-called third rail politics. They worked together to pass tax reform. They worked together to pass immigration reform. We worked together to pass budget reforms. Uh, we were willing to work together. I mean, it, when, when George Bush, uh, uh, the first George Bush was president of the United States, we, we sat at Andrews Air Force Base to develop a budget agreement that would reduce the national debt by almost $500 billion. Tough, but it was bipartisan. We negotiated it and we did it. It takes that kind of leadership to be able to make clear that our first responsibility is to govern. Now, you know, I'm, I'm not sure whether it can change from the top down or whether it has to change from the bottom up. I think what I see is that there are a lot of newer members who have gotten elected to Congress. Uh, there's a group called the Solutions Caucus, which is trying, I think there are 25 Republicans, 25 Democrats trying to work together. Uh, and it's not easy, but they're working together to try to govern. I think we've got to be able to get new leadership established that recognizes that it is not about party over country, it's about country over party. And that gets back to those basics. It is not going to be easy. But I can tell you this, if there is a bipartisan effort that can come together on major legislation that is successful, I think that can send an important signal to the country that Washington get its act together. I don't know if that's gonna happen. It's a long way, it'll demand a tremendous amount of leadership on the part of leaders in both sides of the aisle. But ultimately, we have got to understand that unless we do that, we, the survival of, of our democracy is at stake. Yes, sir. Thank you. It's a tall order. Um, a couple questions have now come in, and uh, here's one that's from the audience. That's uh, it refers back to the Afghanistan situation that you touched on. Um, how did the Afghan withdrawal net out with respect to diplomacy and America's reputation? Um, are there lessons there that we can take aboard and move forward in a productive way? Yeah, there, there's a hell of a lot of lessons here with regards to uh, uh, how, how that uh, Afghanistan was handled that I think we've got to pay attention to. Uh, look, I, obviously for, 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 for Afghanistan itself, uh, after we conducted the bin Laden raid, I think that was an opportunity to try to again look at what exactly is our mission uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, and if Colin Powell leaves us with nothing else, it, he leaves us with the, with the Powell Doctrine, which is, it is extremely important to have a clear mission. What the hell is the mission? Uh, what kind of force do we need to accomplish that mission? And what's the e exit strategy? We didn't do that. Uh, and the result is, uh, obviously, we, we paid a price for that. But in the end, I think what bothers me the most is that as somebody involved in, in the Pentagon, uh, the most important thing we do at the Pentagon is plan for contingencies. 
That's what we do. We, we, we develop plans. We, we have plans for potential war with a number of countries. We have cyber plans. We have all kinds of planning that we do at the Pentagon. Uh, you can't tell me that they didn't do planning with regards to the contingency that things in Afghanistan would collapse quickly. Uh, and yet we were, we, for, for whatever reason, we, were, we did not develop that contingency plan uh, and events got ahead of us. Uh, I think it's really important to understand that when, when we take on a mission, we have got to have a clear idea of what we're trying to achieve. What is it we're trying to achieve? What do we need to achieve it? Uh, and, you know, how long do we need to commit ourselves to that? We never quite did that. We kind of just, uh, you know, took it from day to day. And I understand that I was there. I, I was responsible for deploying forces to Afghanistan. I will say this, that for 20 years, we did prevent Afghanistan from becoming a safe haven for al-Qaeda and for terrorism. Uh, and we had a small number of forces there who were still, it was a small footprint, but it was enough to try to see if we could maintain the effort uh, to, to build up a strong military in Afghanistan. I think it could have taken a little more time. I'd like to believe that there was a way to do this uh, in a more responsible way. I think we have to tell ourselves and ask ourselves, how can we avoid making that kind of mistake in the future? and to learn those lessons so that we never repeat it again. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, next question is about uh, deterrence, but if you're powerful from a diplomatic and military point of view, ultimately your deterrence is effective. But do we need to redefine deterrence? In the past, deterrence meant avoiding uh, kinetic conflict on a major scale in most cases. But today we see the incipient incremental approach such as what's been happening in the South China Sea. Do we need to redefine deterrence to stop that type of behavior before it occurs? A absolutely. Uh, you know, we're, we're facing a, a different kind of threat uh, right now in terms of uh, how we deal with uh, both Russia and China and their approach, which is basically to use cyber, to use uh, you know, alternative forces, uh, to be able to kind of slowly erode stability uh, and use that uh, as, a, uh, as a vehicle to, to, to get their way, to get their way. Uh, and I don't think we have developed uh, a very good capability to respond to that kind of approach. Uh, we need to understand that this is not just, uh, you know, major deterrence where we can blow the hell out of each other. This is a new strategy that's being used against the United States that involves not only cyber capabilities, and it involves new technologies, but it involves the ability to kind of spread their influence around the world. I mean, China is using it very effectively to kind of uh, build, uh, build important, important bases of operation in countries around the world in terms of port capabilities, in, in terms of their economy, in terms of sales. I mean, they have filled a vacuum, unfortunately, that we created with regards to the uh, Trans-Pacific trade operation where we walked away from that deal and China has now moved into that deal. Um, so it's going to have to take place on a number of fronts. Number one, the military has to be able to respond to these kinds of sophisticated threats that we're seeing and be able to stop China and Russia from using cyber capabilities to advance their cause. Uh, we have yet very frankly, to develop the kind of response to these cyber attacks that I think sends a clear message to Russia and to China and to others that they can't do this. They're not, they can't do it without paying a price. And unfortunately, I have yet to see the price to be paid. 
So we've, we've got to strengthen ourselves with regards to uh, cyber capability. We've got to strengthen the United States in terms of our military so that it really is agile enough to deal with threats coming from every direction, not just to conventional war, not just to nuclear war, but to also this kind of shadow uh, war approach that uh, is being used today. And lastly, I really do think uh, our, our diplomatic corps really does need to be strengthened. We've, we lost a great deal these last few years in terms of experience uh, in the diplomatic arena. Uh, we've got to really rebuild that. And that's not easy to do. It's easier said than done, very frankly. You've got to build expertise. You've got to build experience. You've got to build knowledge. Uh, and I mean, when I, when I was dealing with the State Department, I always trusted their, their guidance, their advice, because I knew I was dealing with people who had experience. Uh, we need to rebuild that experience in the diplomatic arena. Otherwise, you know, we're left without, you know, we've got one arm, we've got a right arm, but we don't have a left arm. Uh, and we've got to have both in order to really provide security. Yes, sir. Uh, there seems to be a consensus at some level that the previous administration didn't do enough in state and left a lot of vacant positions and underfunded it. This administration came in and said, we really have been at war for essentially over 20 years and we, we were too much warrior first and the defense should take a back seat. Now we've had the experience in Afghanistan. I was just wondering what your thought is on getting that balance right. Clearly, there's a balance point there. And I would also throw in, um, in this question, intelligence, that can you have military intelligence and diplomacy all living together, working together at the correct set point? Yeah, you know, I, I think that's possible. I mean, I, I, I really do think that uh, one of the important things we have to do is to understand that we have to reflect that partnership in terms of our embassies and in terms of our outreach in other countries, which is not just to have our diplomatic team in one place, but to also have our military team in the same place. I mean, we have military aides, I understand that. But I think uh, having our military leadership and even having our combatant commanders working very closely with those uh, at, uh, at our various consulates and embassies around the world is important to do. I think that intelligence, obviously we have an intelligence station in most embassies, but I think intelligence needs to be part of that as well. Uh, I think we're going to have to develop a very different kind of approach uh, in dealing with both our adversaries and, for that matter, our allies. Uh, you know, we're kind, of, we're, we're kind of stuck in kind of the same old approach we've taken for the last 50 or 60 years. I, I think the world of the 21st century is changing a lot. Uh, and we've got to be a hell of a lot more agile in the way we assert uh, American leadership in the world. We have to have a strong military, but it has to be a military that understands the political side, that understands the diplomatic side, that understands the issues they're dealing with. I mean, yes, we're warriors, but at the same time, we've got to be warriors who understand what the hell we're doing in terms of dealing with other threats in the world. They've got to understand the big picture. That's what I like about the Navy Postgraduate School, frankly, is it provides that kind of education. We need to do that in the Army. We need to do that in the Marine Corps. We need to do that with all of our forces to be able to give them that sense of that bigger picture of the world that we're dealing with. And if we can get ahead of that, if we could develop that kind of real strategy that combines both our diplomatic and military capabilities so that we are developing kind of strategies in, in the countries that we're responsible for dealing with, and, and also strategies in dealing with our adversaries as well as our allies. I think the United States could, could, could truly be in a leadership position. But to do that, we've got to change some bad habits. We've got to change the idea that we've got to just keep doing things the way we're doing now 
we have got to, we've got to be able to adjust to a new century and to the new threats that we're confronting. Sir, thank you very much. Uh, your, your remarks and your questions have been right on target with the themes of today, and we can't thank you enough for your time. We know your time is precious. So on behalf of our Naval Academy audience here today and the U.S. Naval Institute, we thank you, and let's give Secretary Panetta a huge hand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We're going to give you a couple of books, which we'll send you along, Naval Institute books, A Quiet Cadence Great. and Herndon Klein. Thank you very much again. Thanks very much, and best of luck to you and everybody in your audience. Thank you, sir. Great. Out here. So for our audience in person, uh, we're going to take a short break. We have our final panel coming up at 1320, 1.20 p.m. Eastern time for those who are beaming in and that we have a very large uh, audience joining us virtually today, which we truly appreciate. So please take a break till 1.20. We'll start right back there with our final panel. Thank you very much. <laughs>